So not counting Jesus, I just want to throw this out there. If, if you were to think of the greatest person in Scripture, the greatest character, like the goat of Scripture, you know what I mean by goat, right? And it's the new cool thing. To say. It's not really that new, but I, you know, I'm, I'm getting old. So it's, it's the greatest of all time. Who would you say is the greatest of all time when it comes to Scripture? It always seems like every sports channel is always having this debate, right? The greatest NBA player, which is not LeBron. It's, it's Michael freaking Jordan. Let's just settle that right now. But, but analysts will, that wait way too much money will spend the day arguing about you know, who's the greatest of all time, the greatest quarterback, the, the greatest running back, and everybody gets all amped talking about the greatest person to ever hit a ball with a stick, and we'll spend all day talking about that. But here's my question, is who's the GOAT, the greatest of all time when it comes to Scripture? Again, not counting Jesus. The goat of scripture, who do you think? See, some would say that it's Abraham. A lot of people would say it's Abraham, actually. I mean, God, in fact, as the Bridge Reading Program right now, we're, we're, we're following Abraham's life through Genesis. God made a great nation, Israel, Israel, from Abraham. When God introduced himself to his people, he would say, I'm the God of Abraham. Aside from that, even the largest nation, uh, the, not nation, the largest religion, Islam, claims to trace their roots back to Abraham. So he is hailed as the goat to most people. So it's that Abraham is the goat. Or maybe some would say, no, it's, it's Moses. I mean, Moses freed an entire nation from, from the strongest superpower. And how did he do it? With a staff. He led a nation of slaves to a land, gave them laws, spoke on behalf of God. I mean, he'd be a good goat. In my opinion, like that, it would be Moses for me. But for others, it might be King David, slayed a giant with a sling, conquered Jerusalem, set up one of the most prosperous kingdoms ever seen. He wrote more number one hits than anyone else. Israel today still talks about like the good old days when, of King David. David would be the goat to many people. We're a little male heavier here, though. What about uh, Esther? Or no, yeah, Esther. Like she stopped the genocide of the Jewish people. She saved an entire race. That should be a great one. Or uh, maybe Mary, the mother of God, chosen by God. Catholics worship her today as the queen of heaven. She's a special girl. It's got to be her. She's got to be the goat. Or maybe it's Noah, the only righteous man found on earth. Through his obedience, the human race was spared. I mean, there's a lot of options that we have. And the funny thing is, is when it comes to this debate, it's not really a debate at all. Because Jesus said who the greatest is, and it's nobody from this Hall of Fame. Jesus said, it's this crazy guy right here. <laughs> like, what? John the Baptist? How? Why? Like, Jesus, are we talking about the same guy here? Like, we're talking about the John who eats grasshoppers, makes his own clothes, camps out in the wilderness, like that weird Whole Foods REI guy wearing chacos. Like, are we talking about the same guy here, him? How is John the greatest? Is it because he's your cousin? It kind of seems like a little nepotism there, Jesus. I mean, sure, yeah, John baptized Jesus. That's pretty cool. But come on. John over Abraham? John over Moses? How? Like, John never won a battle. John never wrote a song. John never led a nation. John never, John never stopped a genocide. John never gave birth to God. John never had kids. If Dwight Schrute were here, Dwight Schrute would say he never owned any land. I mean, for, from what we know, John died a lonely, penniless virgin with no list of great accomplishments. How is this guy the greatest? And the answer to that is so rich. You ever wonder if you're living a life that matters? I was thinking about this yesterday. I turned 36 yesterday. And I was sitting, like, last night, you know, day's kind of ending, and I'm like, man, I'm, like, probably more than halfway through my life because I ain't living very long. 36 it's not that I'm going through a midlife crisis, don't get me wrong, but it's like, man, am I, those 36 years, have they mattered so far? Like if eternity is real, and I believe it is, 100 years from now, will I be happy with the life that I've lived so far? This has been a thought that it's like kept me awake at night many times. And think about it for you. A thousand years into eternity, we'll be hanging out, hopefully. A little reunion, so to speak. And we'll be reminiscing about the lives that we led back here. A thousand years. How are you going to feel about this last week that you just lived? Did it matter at all? This last week, did it matter for eternity? A hundred thousand years new eternity? Will you want to reminisce about your life? 
It's like a crazy thought, isn't it? And that thought can really fire you up. It can send you into a midlife crisis, right? Oh, I gotta go harder. I gotta make this life count. I gotta get that promotion. I gotta write that book. I gotta have babies. I gotta climb that mountain. I gotta, I gotta do big things. But then I look at this hall of fame that we talked about. Moses, Esther, Noah, all these people did these like amazing things, yet Jesus says, yeah, they're great, but they're not the greatest. It's this guy right here. So obviously, I have a different grading system than Jesus. What is it about this guy that makes him the goat? That's really the money question. See, far too many of us are on paths that are just wasting our lives. And maybe we need to rethink what we're doing, how we're doing it, and why we're doing it. This text, I really do believe, and this has been my prayer all day, is that this text changes your life. We're going to be in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, I encourage you to grab a Bible. It's page 888 in the Bibles and the chairs. Otherwise, I know a lot of people use phones and tablets. We have the Bridge app with the Bible there, and then they also have notes on the Bridge app as well. But John chapter 3 is where we're going to be. This is what we do as a church, is we just grab scripture and we walk right through it. Sometimes we take a book of the Bible and we slowly walk through it. Sometimes we take a person and we follow their narrative throughout scripture. And that's what we've been doing with John the Baptist. John the Baptist came and led the way for Jesus. And we figure, hey, that'd be great if we could follow John the Baptist right up to Easter. And so that's what we've been doing. John chapter three, I'm going to pray and then we'll jump right in. God, I, I do thank you for your word. I thank you for the God that you are. An almighty creator, creator at the macro level, the designer of planetary orbits, you map those, the galaxies are from your breath, and yet you are also a creator at the micro level, the encoder of DNA. Father, we thank you that you're, just, you're not just a creator that created and walked away like some deadbeat dad, but you are a father who wants to be involved in our lives. That's why we're holding this text in our hands right now. This is from you. May we remember the weight of this moment, that these words are true, timeless words. They are from you. So Father, may we take this time seriously, getting rid of all distractions and really honing in on what you have to say to us. May we be open to your conviction as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we enter into John chapter 3, the arid breeze drifts over the light brown rolling hills. There's not much to stop this wind other than the rare tree here and there pro providing coveted shade from the harsh sun in this area. Very few people call this place home, not enough for even a small settlement. The hills are peppered with small boulders, like they somehow rain down from heaven itself. And the sandy soil yields little crop. Only Grass only ever grows during the short rainy season. The rolling barren hills with no flat land make walking through this a, a big workout. One mile feels like five miles. Less than hospitable area, but it does boast of its own beauty. Though unpopulated, these hills have seen something very curious these last six months. Crowds of people from the elevated, bigger settlements in the greener areas have been coming down to camp out in these rocky hills, all in search for the local celebrity, Wild Man, who calls this hilly place home. Some simply make the trip just to say that they saw him. That thin-framed man, long matted hair, bushy beard, wearing a fur robe, they love how little he cares about fitting in. His bare feet have thick calluses from trekking over this gravelly soil. He's wild, but he is brilliant. He leverages the terrain to use as an amphitheater, standing in a valley and with his gravelly voice spreading upward onto the hills as people sit on, on, on rocks as if they were chairs. After his sermon, he takes the crowds down to the river for baptism. These crowds have only grown, becoming this relentless flood of people, all kinds of people, rich people, poor people, even Roman soldiers. It's just been crowd after crowd after crowd the last few months. This wild man has built something incredible here in this barren wilderness. A revolution seems to be brewing, and it's about to be taken from him. Verse 22, John writes this. It says, after this, now, here's just a little trick. In scripture, whenever you run into after this, you should always look at, okay, what, what is this after? 
because context matters. So what happened before this? Well, the context is, is that Jesus was just having a conversation with a very religious guy about salvation. This is when Jesus had his famous quote, John 3, 16, which even if you're not a church person, you could probably quote that, you know, for God so loved the world that he, that he gave his only son. That's, he's having this conversation with the religious man. This is why Jesus came. He didn't come to just heal people and leave. He didn't come to, to just feed people and leave. Jesus came to connect you to your creator. Everything you crave, every pursuit that you've been on, what you've been looking for is this connection with your creator. And most people spend their lives aimlessly filling that void through stuff, through sex, through image, through, through religion, through politics, through security, just filling that void. We've all been there. Jesus came to fill that void to connect us back to our creator. So that was the conversation that he has with a religious guy, and then this happened. So after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside. Now, if you write in your Bibles, which I encourage you to do because it's just a good habit, kind of keep little notes here and there that next time you come across this text, you can remember this. But if you write in your Bibles, put um, next to Judean countryside, put John with a little question mark. John with a little question mark. And the reason there's a question mark is because this has been John's stomping grounds. This is what he considers home. This is John's area for now. And we're about to see something play out that many people who read their Bibles really miss. But it starts here in the Judean countryside. So here's what's going on. Jesus comes from up north. He's up in the Sea of Galilee area. He comes down the, the Jordan River. And as Jesus is walking down the Jordan River, he's looking for the crowds, specifically for his cousin John. So Jesus is surveying the scene. He's looking for his cousin. And then he finds him. After this, Jesus and his disciples went to the Jane country, so they're going down the, uh, the Jordan River, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. Now, here's that, at this point, you just want to say, hold on, Jesus. This area here is kind of taken. We've got this. You think about it this way. It would be like if tomorrow a bunch of wrecking crews came down this street and they started tearing down a few houses across the street from us, and a new church was being built called capital T, capital H, capital E, the bridge. And they were cooler. Their building has more windows. Their teaching pastor looks like he owns a home. <laughs> they don't have Hayden. So they were just cooler and better. And people start leaving here and going across the street to that church. We'd be over here like, okay, what the heck? What, what are you doing? There's already a church here. There are other places in Chicago that need a church. It's Chicago. The Chicago needs churches. Many places to go. Why are you going across the street from us? This is our spot. And this is how John and his disciples had to feel a little bit. It's like, hey, Jesus, Israel's a big place, man. There are big cities to go to. Why are you coming out here to the wilderness? We were here first. This is our idea coming out here. This is our thing. This is our crowds. We built this. Come on. What, what are you doing? Verse 23. John was also baptizing near Anon, near Salim, because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized for John had not been yet put in prison. Okay, so we showed a map as to where we're at. Here's a picture of where this whole uh, story takes place. Uh, it's a lot of, there were springs, these fresh springs in this area that created some overflow in the Jordan River. So it created some flooding. It's a greener area with all these small little pools. It's kind of like this little oasis. This is where this all happens. And the debate breaks out. Verse 25. Now a discussion rose between some of John's disciples and a Jew, and really in the original language is plural, Jews over purification. Now we're not going to get fully into it, but essentially this is a big debate during this time. Even today, people, Christians, we like to fight about little things sometimes to look really smart. Especially the Christians love to go online and get into online arguments. They just love to find little things to, to you know, blog about and, and, and get, you know, just to look smart often. Much of it is a distraction, and that's exactly what's happening right here. See, John, background is, John grew up in a community that was very strict over purification. So much so that if you were to live, or if you were to grow up where John grew up, if you were to go to his hometown, and you needed to use the bathroom, you would have to leave town to go use the bathroom. How about that? If you had IBS, you're in trouble. You're doing that like awkward, you know, run out of, out of town to go use the bathroom. Now, other Jews, most Jews held to less strict views of purification. But it's like this big debate during this time. So as John is drawing all of these crowds and he's baptizing, some critics come out and are getting upset. 
John is dunking people under the water, but he's not doing the full purification process. And the critics start chirping. They're posting, they're blogging, they're critiquing. You know, John might have the crowds, but it's because he's cutting corners on the purification process. John might be popular, but it's because he's compromising. He was raised better than this. And it just goes to show, with success comes critics. Anytime you taste success, you're gonna taste critics. You can do everything right, and you're still going to get critics. Any level of success, the criticism will come. You get that promotion at work, I guarantee it. Other coworkers are going to talk. Other envious coworkers are gonna talk about you. It's like, I was actually talking to my daughter about this. My daughter, the other night, she was working on this speech that, that she had to write. And she's like, she entered into this little competition and she got permission for, for me to help her. And so she asked if I would help her write her speech. And, and it's a contest. So if she wins, she gets to give the speech in front of the school. And so I was helping her out with that. And we get toward the end of it and she looks at me, she's like, dad, what if I win? And I, I said to her, I was like, well, honestly, honey, speech isn't about winning. It's an art. It's about communicating something that matters. And so if you are able to communicate something that helps other people, then you win. But if you win the contest... You know who's not going to like you, babe? Who? Second place, third place, fourth place, and all of their friends. The people who want to be on the stage but aren't, they're going to be your critics. And that's just life, and that's okay. See, the drink of success has an aftertaste of criti criticism. The drink of success has an aftertaste of criticism every time. It's just reality, and that's what's happening here with John. Some people don't do anything with their lives but sit and critique those who are actually doing something with their lives. And that's what's happening here. Guys come in trying to get all this attention for battling John, but regardless of all this pressure that now John is feeling, John just keeps at it. He doesn't stop. He doesn't stop to fight. He doesn't tone things down. He doesn't change his process to appease them. He just keeps doing what he was told to do. And then another problem presents itself. Verse 26, and they, they meaning John's disciples, came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, meaning Jesus, to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing, and all are going to him now. So first, first came the criticism, then came the competition. You know, put yourself in John's sandals here. A few months ago, John was like an A-list celebrity. C crowds were flooding from the cities to camp out around the wilderness. This was like a first century Woodstock without all the drugs. A few months ago, like it was fun. It was exciting. The crowds were exploding. John's donations were going up. Like, this is the stuff that people just make movies about. Something special is happening. But the moment that Jesus walks on the scene, John loses his spotlight. Jesus starts doing his own baptism service, and John's baptism services start to empty. Everybody's going over to Jesus. And you, can you blame him? I mean, if we were there, who would you want to get baptized by? John's crew or Jesus' crew? Uh, who would you pick? I'd pick Jesus. So there's John. Standing there with his crew in an empty field that used to be packed, this is a depressing sight. And maybe you know the feeling. You ever been part of a failing business or a failing organization and the ship is just going down? Feels like there's just nothing you can do and people are on edge, you know, can't figure out why are we losing here? There's just like no wind in the sails. And it's then you're tempted to be bothered by the other businesses or the other organizations that are actually doing well because their growth reminds you of what you're missing out on. It's depressing and it just kind of weighs heavy on you. Or maybe you feel this personally. A lot of times people feel this in their marriage. You know, they're not really happy with their marriage. It kind of feels like a wet blanket, but you're like, all right, I made this vow, so I'm gonna stick with this, but this isn't all that enjoyable. And then you look at somebody else's marriage, you're like, well, they seem to be having fun. I, you know, I, I, and you kind of like, there's just this, this jealousy that happens. This is how John's disciples are feeling a little bit at this point. We just went from high energy, packed business, to now staring at an empty field. And to sink the knife in deeper, you can hear Jesus' field over there is bustling and packed with faces that used to come to you. And everybody's over there clapping, but you're standing over here by yourself. So first he's criticized, then his crowds are taken. He hasn't even done anything wrong. But there's something beautiful here. And it gives us a glimpse into as why Jesus called John the greatest. Because when the critics are chirping, and the spotlight is taken away. After the crowds leave him, there stands a man 
with character. See, our character, this isn't in your notes, but our character is most revealed when we are attacked or demoted. Our character is most revealed when we are attacked or feel like we're losing. This is when our true colors come out. When someone says something about you, maybe it's a coworker who has it out for you, some office politics happening, or an in-law drama, or there's a false accusation, this is when your character is revealed, how you handle that very moment, how you handle losing, so to speak. And this is exactly where John the Baptist finds himself. And what you don't find John is lashing out. Hey, what the heck, this is my crowd. I deserve this. You don't see him pouting. You don't see him unfriending everybody who left him. You don't see him venting. You don't see his sermons getting super angry. You don't see him giving a cold shoulder to Jesus or any of his disciples. John's true colors are showing here, and they are beautiful. It kind of reminds me of, so the last few years, I've overseen our, our summer staff at our camp. Not like directly overseen them, like directly, directly, but I oversee the program. program. And Camp is, camp is fun and funny. There's just like a lot of moving parts to camp. In one week in the summer at camp, you'll have this influx of over 50 summer staff just ascend onto camp. They need to be trained. They need to meet each other. They need to be placed. And Becky, who uh, she's over at her Northside location, but she really runs with training and, and placing all of our volunteers. And it's just nuts for her. But it is mayhem. And what inevitably happens is a few weeks into the program, into the summer, changes need to take place. It's a very pivotal time for our, our summer camp. Because we'll find out, okay, this person isn't really, they're not really gifted in the position that they're in. You know, things aren't really working out in what they're doing. And so we just kind of switch things up and we move things around. Well, you know, we'll have some meetings and we demote some people and we promote other people. And we're trying to figure out, you know, placement after, after they show up and and we have to work with them. So needless to say, there's a lot of hard conversations. A lot of, you know, hey, I, I know that you want to lead this, but hey, it's, it's just not really working out. We want what's best for you. This is more in line with your strengths over here. So let's just, let's put you over here. And some people respond very poorly in those conversations. Hey, you don't know me. I was told I get to do this. And what, do, what do you have to, this is my job. That's when the true colors come out. And they reveal like, oh, okay, they shouldn't be leading here anyway. We don't want that leadership. But the ones who respond very well, oh, they might be bummed, but they have a good response of like, hey, I get it, it's okay, I'm just here to serve, and I'm happy to do whatever you tell me to do, I'm just here to serve. Those are the people where it's like, okay, those are the people who shine this summer. We want, they're our greatest staff. They have great character. This is what we are seeing with John. His baby was just taken away from him. What he worked so hard to get started, he's criticized for, and then the people leave him. And yet, look at his response in verse 27. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. My goodness, what a profound statement in scripture. Essentially what John is saying here is, this is not my territory. This is God's territory. I'll do whatever. This is extremely high emotional intelligence. This is rare emotional intelligence, and it gives us a lesson. Lesson from the goat, from himself. You want to live a life of of significance? Loosen your grip. Loosen your grip. Some of us are held back in life, and some of us are living miserable because we have such a tight grip on what we love. Kids, job, status, whatever it is. In fact, churches are notorious for being filled with people who have a tight grip on everything. Yeah, this is my church. Don't change a thing. This is our camp. Don't change a thing. This is our small group. Don't change a thing. Don't add people. It's our friends. Tight grip. And churches like that die. Because when you have a tight grip on today, you can't receive God's tomorrow. When you have a tight grip on today, you can't receive God's tomorrow. And so eventually what happens is people who hold on to today become irrelevant in the future. They can't receive God's tomorrow. And we're miserable, running around gripping things as if they're ours and trying to keep a grip on everything. A life lived like that is almost as pathetic as a dog peeing on hydrants to claim them. You ever see that? You ever take your dog for a walk? You know, the dog like just like pees on it and you're like, dude, just because you peed on it doesn't mean it's yours. But I wonder how often God does that with us. Hey, just because you made this business doesn't mean it's yours. Just because you formed that group doesn't mean it's yours. Just because you were given that leadership, just because you go to that church, 
it doesn't mean it's yours. I have something better for you. Like, can you actually say verse 27? Hey, it's all from God, not mine. I'm just here to do what he's told me to do, not my own way. Because most people can't say verse 27. And so what happens is we begin to live this miserable life. And we actually fight God. We tighten our grip as God slowly takes things away from us. And it's the slow, miserable death for a lot of people. I mean, you think about it. If John would have gripped these crowds, you'd have been standing in the way of God's work. And instead of being a hero in, in, in scripture and being called the goat who set the stage for God, he would have gone down as this pathetic man who had the gall to try to get in the way of what God was doing. And that can so easily be us. I think it is some of us sometimes. The way I think of it is, so my oldest daughter is upset with me right now. And I got her permission to share this today. But uh, she's not happy with me about something. And she hasn't been happy with me for a month. We still have a great relationship. We had fun yesterday. Everything's fine. But there's this, anytime this topic comes up, she's just not happy with me. See, ever since COVID, we've been homeschooling our girls, and it's been awesome. Like, we just travel when we want. The kids go to a classroom on Thursday, but other than that, they just, got, they just get to, like, we just get to enjoy, enjoy the freedom. However, we might send our, our girls to the school that our church is opening a, a campus in. It would just, it would work great. I know the faculty there, just this major blessing, it seems like this is kind of where God is leading us. And so we communicated that to our girls, and my oldest is not happy. She hates change, and she's gonna be a headache for her pastor one day. Just like any change for her is just bad news. And so ever since Nicole and I announced this change to our girls, Madison has had an attitude. And the thing of it is, is like, I know what's best for her. She's going, and this is what's best for her. She's going to have so many more friends. She'll have hands-on learning, amazing teachers. Their art program and their music program is awesome. Like, she loves that stuff. She's gonna be in heaven, but she's just gonna be miserable until then. <laughs> She's mad at me, and she's been miserable because she has this tight grip on her current situation. And some of us have been like this for decades. We're just holding on, fighting, losing battles, getting in the way, and living miserable. Meanwhile, your dad is saying, hey, I've got something much better for you. Now, it's going to be a little humbling to take that, that road but I have something better for you. It might be a little scary, but I have something far more incredible for you. See, if you tighten your grip on what you have now, you will miss out on what God has for you later. And I see this play out so often in people's lives, just gripping on today, and God's like, I'm leading you here to do something amazing, but you're gonna miss it because you're just back here stuck on yesterday. And that is tragic. What kind of a life is that? A life of holding on to lesser things while missing out on greater things. John's got so much for us. He continues on, verse 28. This is such good stuff. He says, look at this, verse 28. He says, you yourself bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who is the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, his joy of mine is now complete. So essentially what he says is, all right, guys, I know you're upset that the crowds have left, but listen, I'm not the groom with the spotlight. I'm just the best man. I'm here to support my buddy, fix his tie, cheer him on. John knew his lane. And this is when most people get miserable is when they want all the lanes. John knew this is my job. This is what God has asked me to do. So I'm going to humbly do it. John just had to clear the way, prepare the way, and then get out of the way. Create a stage, gather a crowd, and re-aim the spotlight and give it to somebody greater. And that is hard. And it gives us point number two, lessons from the goat. You want to live a life of significance? Reflect something greater than your desires. Reflect something greater than your desires. Most of us just reflect our own desires. It's kind of like if, if you were to come over to my house after church, and it's not an invitation because I won't be there, but if you were to come over to my house after church, you would walk into the front door and you would see a house that is a reflection of Nicole and I. It's not much to look at, 
but like the style and the decoration is like a reflection of Nicole and I. So the first thing you might see when you walk in is like, oh, there's like this little, this little like barrel stave that has our family name on it, burned into it, established 2010. That just kind of represents us. Or the old water jug below it is a gift from a friend who knows that I just, I, I love industrial antiques. My couches are from a childhood friend. I grew up jumping around on those. His family uh, owned these and was gonna get rid of them. And I was like, man, it's like a childhood reminder. Uh, so I was holding on to yesterday. I just said, I'll, I'll take the couches. But, uh, and, the, and then you walk in the kitchen, you would see a poster of where Nicole and I, we had our first date, snowboarding at Devil's Head. And then down the hallway is this little old map of, where, of Madison, Wisconsin, where Nicole and I got married. Like, this is just kind of what we do with our houses, right? It's great. Our houses are often a reflection of who we are. It's why we invite each other over to each other's houses if we want to get to know each other, because that's just a great way to get to know each other, to see each other's house. And there's nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing. A lot of our lives are simply just a reflection of us and us only. I'm not talking about our houses right now. Our lives. Our days are a reflection of our desires and our dreams, and that's it. So who we make friends with, how we spend our money, how we spend our time, how we lead, it's just a reflection of what we want. See, you and I, we are walking windows. That's what we are. We're just a walking window. And I can look at your last week, how you lived this last week. I can look into your window and I can see your desires. Like, okay, you spent your money on that. Uh, You spent your time doing that. You pursued these friends. I can tell your desires based on looking through your window and seeing your life. And you could do the same for me. Jesus called John the goat because somehow John broke outside of the typical. John, his time, his money, his relationships, everything showed someone greater than himself. His life was not a reflection of his wants, but of somebody, great, somebody greater. We are windows of our wants. John, however, was a window into the kingdom of God. And this is why people were fascinated by John. Because they looked at John. And he was a little bit wild to look at, but they looked at him and he was just different. And it wasn't just his looks. His attitude was different. The people that he pursued is just different. How he spent his time is just different. He was far, far different than anybody they'd ever seen, especially their neighbors. Seeing John was like looking into a window and seeing the kingdom of God. It was captivating. That's why the crowds were drawn to him. John Calvin, who, other than wearing great hats and had a great beard, I love what he wrote. He wrote, we must make the invisible kingdom visible. This is when you are at your greatest. When you are making the invisible kingdom visible in your life. See, our windows show our wants, but they can also show the great invisible kingdom. So that when people look at your family, or when people look at your team, or when people look at your classroom, without knowing it, it's like they're looking at the kingdom of God a little bit. There's just something different about their leadership, how they lead their staff, how they lead their office. They bring the best out in others and they create this fun culture. Oh, they have hard conversations, but they stick to their values and they won't cut corners. I want that. I want to work for one of them. Now your leadership isn't this reflection of your desires. You're simply acting as a window, showing something greater, the kingdom of God at your office. Or people look at your marriage or your dating relationship or your friendships, but they look at your marriage and they think, you know, they're not faking a great marriage like the rest of us, you know, with our sappy Facebook posts. <laughs> like, look at them, like, they're real. They're selflessly serving each other. And there's submission, that's kind of weird, but there's also leadership and they're one. Like, I want a marriage like that. Now your marriage isn't a reflection of what you want out of your marriage. Now your marriage is like simply this window that is displaying the beautiful kingdom of God. Or people look at your home. They walk in and they think, wow, there's like, there's no yelling. They don't run from hard conversations. They talk about real things. They enjoy each other. There's fun. I want a home like that. Now your home isn't this window displaying your desires and what you want out of your family and how you want your kids to act. Now you're just this window displaying the beautiful kingdom of God. See, the main question that followers of Jesus should ask ourselves every single morning is how do we do this? How can my window display more than my desires? How can my window make visible the invisible kingdom of God? This is the quest for followers of Jesus. 
We wake up with this obsession. How do I do this today? How do I do this in my marriage? How do I do this at work? How do I do this with my kids? And how do I do this with my friendships? It's this obsession that drives us to lead these lives that actually matter a thousand years from now. I really do believe one of your greatest sins, my greatest sin, is that we just constantly settle for less. The windows, our windows, just, they just display our wants. You were created for more. And John finishes up with the most incredible statement ever spoken, in my opinion. He says, he, meaning Jesus, must increase. I just must decrease. And I can't help but think that John had a little bit of pain when he said that in his voice. Everything that I spent to build this up and those faces and those crowds and all that excitement, it's okay. That's what God's doing. And I'm gonna trust him. He's gonna increase and I must decrease. And it's this right here that tells us why Jesus said John's the goat. And keep in mind, John was a high capacity leader. He's, he could rough it out in the desert. A creative orator that would draw massive crowds from their comfort into the wilderness. He was a leader of leaders, facilitating a movement, creating this crazy wave of change. He was a man of, of a caliber that is very rare. And a, a man of caliber, caliber that's very rare is very susceptible to knowing his own greatness. But make no mistake, this was his heart. He must increase I must decrease, and that's okay. It's the last lesson from the GOAT. You want a life that matters a thousand years from now? Champion humility. Champion humility. The core of most of our sin is pride. The core of most of our relational issues is pride. The core of the messes that we get into is pride. Jesus' declaration of John being the greatest is owed to John's humility. John built something incredible and held it with a loose grip, and he just gave it away. He wasn't about himself. His window displayed something greater than him, and he was willing to decrease. See, humility echoes loud into eternity. I really do believe that. Humility echoes loud into eternity. It is not what we build. It is not what we keep. It is not what we have a firm grip on. It is not what we make. It is our humility that echoes loud into eternity. And the truth is, one day, you and I will stand before God, before his throne. The scripture tells us that the creator's throne room, what it's like, 24 thrones around the great throne, seven torches of fire in front of the throne, Scripture tells us that an emerald haze that hangs in the air, and through the emerald haze, you can see flashes of lightning from the throne, thunder claps echoing off the crystal flooring. You and I will be there. And in that moment, our eyes shall see him, and we will be awestruck and unable to stand. Falling to our knees, we will feel like nothing, tasting the reality of how small we really are. We will feel Terror in that moment. And I want to enjoy that moment. But the only way I'm going to enjoy that moment is if I live humbly before it. In that moment, as I stand before God, man, I so want to say, God, I lived with a loose grip on my days so that I could receive your tomorrows. It's all about what you wanted. I so want to say my life is just a window displaying you, your desires. I just wanted to display you, not me. I so want to say to God, God, my 70 years, I just decreased every day my 70 years so that you would increase every day in my world. I can't say that yet. I'm not there yet. I'm not, I'm not ready. I've got work to do. And it starts with humility. Humility. It starts with loosening a grip on my life, on my title, on my jobs, on what I think I'm entitled to, so that my life can make the invisible kingdom visible 
to those around me. And that kind of life leads to a wild adventure. Something worth reminiscing, even when it's all said and done. And so we ask ourselves, so what? As we always do, we come to God's word. Words here that John spoke are just so beautiful and so convicting. So what? How does John's story change your story this week? I have a more generic question I just want to toss your way, but it's something to think about, and that is, is what is God convicting you of? Because this is what God does. We open up God's word every single time he convicts. Now, often we don't feel that conviction. We're distracted. We're not looking for that conviction. But the reality is every time you read scripture, God wants to convict you. He's been trying to convict you this last half hour. What is he convicting you of? What is it for you? For some of us, the Holy Spirit's been convicting us that we need to loosen our grip. I have such a tight grip on our kids. I have such a tight grip on our titles. I have such a tight grip on what we think we're owed. And meanwhile, God's saying, you're living a miserable life because I have so much more for you, but you've got to loosen your grip. For others of us, our lives, we just, it just points to ourselves. We're simply just windows into our wants, how we spend our time, how we spend our money, the words that we say, the attitudes that we carry is just simply a reflection of us and our sin. Maybe for some of us, it's a conviction of humility. You haven't been championing humility. You haven't seen yourself as prideful, maybe, but you certainly can't say you've been championing humility. And the reality is that is pride. To not be able to admit that. What is it for you? How does God's word change you? We're just gonna take this time of corporate reflection as we always do, just a little bit of time space before God to make some confession, to make some commitments, and we'll close out in just a second, but this time is yours.